Today is Sunday, June 21st, 2020. My name is Vincent Pena. I'm interviewing Tony Pena for the Voices Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know, Mr. Pena, that this interview will be placed in the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection at the University of Texas at Austin. If there is anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there is something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we will talk about it. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting. So I'll ask you a series of five questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each one. There are two questions we need to make sure you agree to before we go on. Volsa's wishes to archive your interview, along with any other photographs and other documentation at the Benson Library at UT Austin. We will retain copyright of the interview and any other materials you donate to Volsa's. Do you give Volsa's consent to archive your interview and your materials at the Benson Library? Yes, I agree. Do you grant Volsa's copyright over the interview and any material that you provide? Yes, I agree. Do you agree to allow us to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes, I agree. We have many questions in a pre-interview form, which we have already filled out. We use that information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is kept in a secure Volsa's server. Before we send it to the Benson, we would have stripped out any contact information for yourself or family members. So that, you will be not, so that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at the Benson Library. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at the Benson? Yes, I agree. On occasion, Volsez receives requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your news, your phone numbers or your email with journalists? Yes, I agree. Okay. So to get started first, I'm um, just going to ask you to uh, tell me a little bit about yourself, um, family, what you do for work, uh, where you live, that kind of thing. Uh, my name is Tony Pena. I am 29 years old, originally from Phoenix, Arizona. I have lived in Portland for the last three years, going to be four years in September. Um, I currently am in tech in customer support. I've been doing that for three years as a senior customer advisor. Uh, I also am a employee resource group co-chair for the queer resource group. Um, and let's see what else do I do. <laughs> I'm on the regional advisory council as well. So I am in charge of helping bubble up feedback from systematic improvements for my location within my company to work on a global coalition to improving workplace engagement and provide, uh, how would you say, structural suggestions to just improving overall employee participation. And yeah, I like to read in my off time and I would consider myself a political activist in the off time for just regular social justice. <laughs> And did you say where you work? Yes, I work at Squarespace. And what is Squarespace? Squarespace is a website and domain company. Um, started off as a blogging platform and now is a multi-product internet house, but I think it defines itself as a still a website and domain builder. Okay, so now we're gonna delve a little bit into uh, um, the current you know, coronavirus pandemic. So. Would you tell us how you first learned about uh, COVID-19? I had first heard about COVID-19 back in, I think, October. I had heard about it by reading the BBC and the NPR about global pandemics and specifically one that was being seen in China. And it was some type of weird respiratory infection that people, I think, what happened was is it started happening in Wuhan but I think that we weren't getting the true story about it, but there was this news thing that there had been this infection that was coming out of China. Um, and I think they had seen it in a couple other places, but that was the first time I'd ever heard of coronavirus, I think at the time, um, specifically of that one. Okay, so then what was your initial reaction to the information about COVID, either in uh, you know, its presence in China or when it started to, uh, expand across the world and spread in full transparency i have during my lifetime i've seen an annual i feel like an annual or biannual uh foreign pandemic um from h1n1 to 
mad cow disease, Zika, Ebola. I saw just a series of these things come up. Come up. So while they're alarming, and it always was something to be like, oh, this is something that's actually going to be affecting someone around the world. Uh, I did not think it was anything that was going to affect my life. I thought it was something that was probably going to affect travelers. And uh, judging by the early reports, I think that was what the biggest thing that I thought this was going to amount to is that for some reason we wouldn't be able to like globally travel. But I in no way thought it would impact my life outside of that. <laughs> I never thought it was going to actually impact anything to do with my day to day. I was just thinking this was another global crisis, but that I was going to be completely unaware or impacted by it. So then at what point did you uh, realize it was serious or think that it was serious? I think the first time that I got a little wary was when we found out that people who had traveled internationally and traveled back from China had started to get it. And living in Portland and the Pacific Northwest, there's a lot of frequent visitors between Asia and the United States, specifically through Seattle, San Francisco. And they, when they come to those places, like to travel up the coast and they come to Portland frequently. And not that Portland doesn't get direct visitors as well, but in general, we are like on this constant loop of tourism. And so when we found out that people were most susceptible from these traveling places, I think that's when I got worried. And when we found out Seattle started to coincide with New York's outbreak, and then we found out San Francisco was, I think San Francisco was one of the worst, the first cities to like get ahead of this, shut down, institute quarantine. And so when they started doing this really early on, I got immediately worried. And just through a series of, uh, online publications, seeing the other Europeans that started to shut down, I was worried that we were going to follow suit. And I think once San Francisco did, um, I realized that this wasn't something that was just going to be brushed under this, the table and it was immediately going to impact my life. <laughs> and that's when I got, yeah, I think that was the immediate red flag that this was something stateside and something that was going to change everything. And then I think once, Oregon is a very already liberal place, we're very ahead of the times. I mean, a non-crisis with like recycling happened and our state already had let a lot of us know. So we had heard about COVID, I think at a state level, they were talking about it before this really got big, but not until other city took action did I really take it seriously. I still treated it like anything else and I kind of ignored the severity. Okay, then I guess, you know, you kind of touched on the, the impact, how, um, given your initial response was, you know, you might not think it was that serious, even as it was coming over. Uh, how has it impacted you um, now that it has become a reality? Uh, you can talk about, you know, time in quarantine or isolation, but just in general, how has it impacted you, uh, broadly speaking? That is a very, I can imagine this is a very deep question and deep answer. Um, uh, and you can, I guess we can like we can like kind of like sparse it up because in order to like kind of and then we can see how it intersectionally compares but I would definitely say work life let's start there unlike the other 40 percent of America I have not been laid off so work my job was lucky and they were very very open being a global company like we have a office in New York and in Dublin and so being a New York based company and having a based in Dublin, I think gave us a unique perspective to this disease. And so when Dublin started to have to shut down and started having to implement these quarantines and social distancing implementations, our company actually followed suit beforehand. So I would say in February, we started seeing more hand sanitizer all over the office. We were having daily desk cleanings. Um, they were already aware of not having communal spaces. So like we, instead of things started to just, we have catered lunch. Um, and so we started having disposable just things and just, I started noticing changes in the everyday workplace. And then when Dublin had to go fully remote, we instantly were told that we had the option to go remote. Two weeks, so that brings us to about like the end of February. The beginning of March, it started being told that we no longer had, so we have remote employees, um, but we are office-based primarily, and for the exception of people who have been given dispensation or just have been negotiated into remote, um, you get an option to work as a perk, but it's not like a full-time thing. We got the option fully at the beginning of March to work remotely, and then I would say 
two weeks later, it became a full instituted rule that we had to work remotely. Um, so since March, mid-March, I've been working fully remote, which has been very hard to navigate. I think that people who choose to work remotely have something about their workflow that makes it really awesome for myself. Uh, I'm a social human, and so I didn't realize how much I relied on that until I was told I couldn't have it anymore. <laughs> and so that's been pretty difficult navigating. And it was particularly hard because you work in a, I happen to work for tech and in order to troubleshoot and in order to help solve people's problems that requires a lot of community-based knowledge. And it's a lot easier to look to someone on your team and get verbal communication or get that instant knowledge Whereas you don't get that in a technologically communicative base. So having to use another platform to communicate with while I'm already communicating, communicating with my customers, then having to reach out to teammates um, while having to research these issues and test. So I actually have, now I'm having to be concurrent in communication modes and that takes some time to develop, but being told overnight, like, all right, now you have to move this home. While some people look at that as a blessing, and absolutely it is that I have the privilege to continue working, um, getting used to that was incredibly hard. And I, before my tech job, was in restaurants. So I've never really worked solo, ever. And I've never been in a job that required me to work solo. And so that was extremely hard to adjust to. And I think that can lead into the personal and social side of it. I mean, as a queer man in Portland, I instantly went from being able to have a, and Portland is a very, very social city. It's similar to the other hip cities around America, you know, like the entire, our entire lifestyle revolved around foods and going out. And ironically, it was Portland Dining Month. So to make it so Amer American statement, like I had just been having a plan of doing this tour to like go across the city and eat this amazing food. And within a week, you know, we're told like, okay, I'm not working from work and people were starting to self quarantine and I like had taken it seriously. I'd canceled my like social events, I think. Yeah, I canceled them, I think at that point. Um, but I knew other people that were still going out and I think it wasn't until Portland decided, like we'd heard rumblings at two weeks from where I was at that point that restaurants were about to shut down. Um, we had entered a full quarantine. And so having now we're like four months in, I mean, I can just say that it's been just overwhelming. <laughs> COVID has drastically shifted everything from social groups. Um, you know, I was with my roommates and we quarantined with neighbors who happened to be coworkers and friends. But aside from that, we had no social interaction v except via social media platforms. And even that is um, not the easiest if you're not really tapped into that. So I think, Again, that fluctuates on the human. I'm not really someone who's really always into my communicating via the phone all the time. And so there went my social life and that was really hard. So you have work becoming very isolating and your social life is gone and there's really nowhere else to go. So it's not like even if you left your house, like Oregon shut down, I think at the end of March and we've been in full quarantine like yesterday. So that would have been the... just looking at the date. So the 20th would have been the first day that Portland has opened. So our bars and restaurants finally can have people come in and sit down. So that's been pretty, pretty insane. And we just got park access, I'd say like a month and a month ago. So it's been a very hard adjustment. <laughs> sorry, I just actually, I'm not sorry, but um, I just haven't been asked to explain what this whole experience has been like before. So that's a pretty expansive answer, but yeah, I mean, it's, Nothing and no part of my life has been untouched by it. So, complete shift. Okay, so you, I want to ask you about something there. You talked about you um, quarantining with your roommates and your neighbors. So, would you describe uh, kind of what that situation is like and uh, how many people you have in your uh, quarantine circle? Yeah, absolutely. So, my neighbors literally live three doors down and they are two other queer friends that I have. Like I said, I work with that. I work with one of the two. And so that brings my three roommates and those two in their household, their partners. Um, so that's a total of five. And 
we agreed at the beginning that since I work with Caleb, that Caleb is one of their names. Um, am I allowed to use real names? Okay, so my neighbor Caleb uh, and their partner, they live next door. And so we decided that this is going to be a long, hard time. And clearly the it was told us right away that they didn't want us to be going to our friends' houses, which I understand. They were like, literally, don't go. We don't care if it's family. We don't care, whatever. If it's not the grocery store, stay home. But you understood. But at the same time, like, I don't think that a lot of people in next door, their friends and their loved ones aren't their next door neighbor. So we decided that we were going to enter a quarantine pact. And we said, if we did this, no one was allowed to join. So while quarantine was mandated, we also mandated that as well. So no one was allowed to have guests outside of us. We were allowed to go to and from each other's apartments, but only to and from each other's apartments. Um, and at this time, we didn't understand that contact wasn't a huge way that this virus moved. So I think actually what we had been doing was kind of against what they had suggested. But we had figured we live in an apartment complex, shared laundry facilities, we share an office, we share everything on the property, mailboxes. So if it was as severe as we were told about contact, once someone got it in the apartment, everyone else was likely to get it. So we just decided that we were going to just kind of deal with it. And so we kind of just entered that and we didn't leave anywhere. We had, we even like kept the contact between the houses, not always constant, but like we had set days that we would meet. So every Friday we had something like a family dinner type of thing. And then we'd meet two other times, but we weren't like always in constant anything but anytime that we would happen to go to like shopping we let each other know so we were very aware of each other's travels um and it wasn't until the end of may or during may that we even both saw other people and opened up but that's when the city around us started to open up so we started to kind of experiment with that and we had people over and they had i think saw someone but they had like masks on so that was kind of weird. Like we stayed in mask attire for a while and it wasn't until we'd been in each other's space for a while that we like took it off. So it's weird how like this comfortability comes into play with people because I also went to protest and like my mask stayed on most of the time. But when it came to social settings, all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, I guess I can be around you. Oh, we've been around each other for hours. And all of a sudden you have this perception that like now the germs will just, they're dead. But it's like, oh, wait, I guess we shouldn't take our mask off anymore. But we've opened up a little bit. Um, so I don't think we're, like, exactly quarantine family. But at the moment, we, like, still hold that firm. So, like, we only travel together. And if people come over, we still let each other know. And, like, still kind of in, like, asking permission to do anything huge. So it's just, like, it's remained. The rules have still made in play. We've just gotten a little bit more liberal with them. Okay. So then uh, do you have any... Uh... Um, have you yourself seen people outside of that or have there been, I guess, what's the, the impact been on your other friendships or social uh, interactions um, outside of, you know, being in the so-called quarantine family? Uh, how has it affected other relationships, be it, you know, just friendships or romantic relationships or the like? Um, well, romantic wise, definitely there is no romantic life. I don't even like, absolutely not even like a thing i don't think that like for being someone who's 29 like it's just not really something i'm focusing on right now my job is way more important i think we're entering global recession like no one has money to date even if we were to date there's nothing to do you can't travel you can't like i have a vehicle but i can't use public transit like there's just so many things that make that not really like something that even seems entertaining so for me that's completely gone I would then have to say that like on that social life my social life has gotten good with some people I feel like those who I'm close with were close with before quarantine I would say like established friendships have remained solid or have gotten closer because you now purposefully are reaching out with these people you're planning it I would say that like work relationships got closer because work was the only place of these people that actually understood me because both of my roommates were laid off so for a while, I felt a lot closer to people I didn't live with because they understood the change and transition I was going through. Um, 
But then at the same time, on that same page, my relationship with my roommates completely changed. Like, I think that, well, I live with a friend who I've known for 20 years. And so for me, that relationship only experienced a new chapter of deepness. The other friendship, you know, like we've lived together, out of the four years I've lived here, I lived with this other roommate for two of them. And I would say that, but this situation with COVID, I think brought us closer together in the terms of like, you strip away being able to go out, you strip away all side distractions. I've lived with these people day in and day out for three months and they've had no job to go to. Like <laughs> we, they, there were definitely like weeks at a time when we did, hadn't left the house except to go to the grocery store. And so I think relationships not only became super interconnected, they became more meaningful. And I think what's hard in saying that is, is like now sociability wise, as a very social extrovert, I have no concept of what it's like to make new friends now. Because how does one make new friends in this new age where like, even if you go to a restaurant, at least in Portland's phase one opening, you, you're not even allowed to go to a new table. So like, what's the part of going to, a, our bars reopen, but now they're considered restaurants because you have to stay at your table. Everyone has to wear a mask and you're not allowed to join new tables. So what is the point of trying to meet new people? And if you try to meet him online, I think that's cool. I think there is a lot of online camaraderie that's happening right now. So a lot of online friendships are sustained, especially through the George Floyd and Black Lives Matter movement. I think a lot of us have united and interconnected through that, or a lot of people who are people of people of color are connecting through their shared experiences. People who are not can are not people of color, so white people are connecting through shared allyship and like relearning that. But like, I don't feel new friendships are budding at this time and I, I see that just from a macro level I don't see new friends being like oh my new friend you know um and I don't hear about new friendships so I just feel like they have been sustained or have gotten deeper but no one is like meeting and I'd be really impressed if people have actually found this opportunity to meet new people because that was definitely nothing that I wanted to do <laughs> during this time so then, um, I guess, would you mind describing, I guess, what the, the time in quarantine has been like? I know you already talked about um, isolating yourself and your roommates with your, your neighbors, but what's been like a typical day? What have you, um, what does that life look like now? Yeah. So before, like, you have your, like, your morning routine. Like, as any person in the Western world would know, you wake up, you have your, like, breakfast ritual. I mean, your get ready ritual. Then you have your brekkie, and then you go on work and start work so my that completely shifted and so now I pretty much like wake up grab some coffee that was already preset from the night before and I jump right into work and then once work was done I'd go on like a walk probably around like three mile walk if I'm being light or a five mile walk if I was trying to like work up a sweat come home eat dinner hang out with roommates go to bed and that was like a work week for a while and then on the weekends it was like wake up family breakfast do individual chores the one like activity that was like the focal point during this time was probably the walk so like we'd walk together we'd walk alone when people's emotions cycled through happiness or uh, or anything like the walk was the way to kind of get away it was the way to exert independence um you know i started like definitely relying a lot more on therapy during this time as well in order to cope with just with a lot to deal with everything and it, it's kind of as isolating as it is you feel isolated and then you feel like you don't have enough space because you're with the same people all the time and then you feel interrupted because your normal sociability is gone. it just it's just complex complex emotions and it was like sometimes you almost find yourself creating drama just because you were so bored with the it was so monotonous and it was so redundant like you'd wake up there it was there was nothing to do like they didn't like and for the first weeks when we were in covid the crazy part was is like our restaurants all shut down for the exception of like to go only so the only thing that was open was chains because they had the ability to quick transition right they have they have millions of dollars on standby to like fine you want dining rooms closed done you want half the staff gone gone like, they were able to adjust. And so, like, I don't think we, my roommates and I ate out until probably April. Like, 
trans that first month, like we really were so about cooking at home and doing everything. And that itself is like kind of you enter a partnership and the relationship shifts and being millennials, like, sure. Yeah. We like are all three people individual and like, yeah, we've had dinner before, but prior to COVID you would, I mean, I was definitely someone who ate out all the time. So having to cook again, having to like rely on those resources, having to like constantly think about what we had in the fridge. Like those are things that you didn't really think about are actually a whole part of a lifestyle. So like, while I'm working, like we're constantly also having to talk about shopping lists, what we want for dinner, what we want for lunch, what do we want for breakfast? What I felt like I was in a polyamorous relationship with my roommates because like we had to rely, like you had to shift, right? It, like it made no sense to be individual while this was going on because what's the point of having to buy three sets of toilet paper, three sets of things? Like we had to community, we were forced into a community and that resource sharing taught us a lot about ourselves. But like, I realized that was, you know, it was kind of also hard to like hear other friends forced into the same type of resource sharing with people that they didn't like or people that they didn't even want to be a part of, you know, like I I have the luxury of knowing my two roommates. So that was definitely something that was an eye opener. Like, you know, to think of like life, but the generations before and like, this is what it was. Like people didn't always go out to eat. People didn't have, you know, the type of social life that we give ourselves and so dinner and a walk were like the highlights of our day you know like I think like the Netflix and the movie watching are just something you don't even have to talk about because in terms of activity that was just constant in the background like the movies that we did um I think the one thing that quarantine did shift was I read so much more now because the Netflix and the media consumption had to go away quickly in order to st sustain like actual like sanity. Like I needed like challenging things because when you get rid of that sociability, it's like your brain craves other ways to like feel engaged to something because you don't really get to challenge yourself. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. It kind of was a nice transition into um, the next part of this, which is uh, about uh, healthcare, um, both in terms of um, financial concerns or uh, physical concerns or effects. Um, but so I guess to start off, you mentioned something in there about, uh, you know, to keep your sanity and how you uh, cope with that. So how is uh, maintaining mental health during a time of isolation, especially as, you know, um, you know, obviously COVID, the big concern or the pre more prevalent concern uh, is the physical impact um, that it can have when you, if you contract it. But uh, given that people are in isolation, um, that obviously can have a, a mental uh, health impact as well. So how would you, if you mind, would you, how would you say that's affected you and how have you dealt with it? I think uh, I brought up a point earlier about going to therapy and I would definitely have to say that like relying on like professional help was something in, that I immediately sought after. And I think that it actually helped cope with act with a lot of the trauma that we face having your way of life completely changed. And I don't think if it had been for counseling, had it not been for counseling, I wouldn't have had the tools to cope with the isolation and the social distancing. Um, I think aside from that, you know, maintaining a, maintaining a kind of schedule really helped. I think trying to rely on activities, but also just realizing that the entire world was going through it. That shared collective trauma, that shared collective ex human experience, I think is what really helped take it off of myself. While like therapy helped coach how Tony dealt with it, you know, knowing that everyone was dealing with this, like watching videos of people in Africa or China or Europe or South America, just like literally doing the same thing I was doing in their own way, I think was a little bit of a different experience than it had been before. And this has been an American thing. For some reason, I think that I would have been, I've already felt a lot more contention for like the way that other states, being from Arizona and seeing the way that Arizona at the end of this is actually going through one of the worst infection rates in the world. And we're talking about one municipality in one country is equivalent, is having worse rates than entire countries is, one asinine that it should be happening in one of the most developed nations in the world with one of the strongest and most prolific health 
science communities in the world. I'm not saying it's the most accessible, but I'm just saying we have some of the strongest, brilliant minds in the world that study this, and we have some of the worst cases. And sorry, a little bit of a tangent there, but yeah, like all of that, I think is it's it's a lot because being someone who just moved to a new place and watching my city take care of it was okay. Like this was great. I felt like my governor took it seriously. My county took it seriously. I felt that the government overhead was okay. But then watching my state, my home state, my home, my family, my friends treat this kind of like a, like nothing had happened while my life was extremely 360 something completely new was really hard and it felt it felt traumatic and it, i think i can now say that with a lot more validation because it is like anybody who in january would have told an american that they would have to be in a mask six feet away from human beings and possibly not be able to get a haircut for however long some people did not have to get one they would have laughed in your face and just to experience that and then to watch other people treat it like a joke and then to now my entire family back home it could be possibly exposed could go through it it still applies a lot of stress just because i might be in a better situation than they are in a better or i might be taken care of um they're not taken care of you know there's an expression when you get on a plane put your mask on before you put someone else's on but it's like okay but like my family's up in the front and i have to run to go get them how do i keep my mask on so like, it's complicated because I feel safe and I feel okay now, but other people are not okay. We're definitely not out of the woods yet. You know, we're being told that this is only the first wave. So like, it's scary. But being a queer man, this isn't the first virus that I have been fearful from my whole life. Like I grew up being told that I was gonna die of HIV or AIDS. So to me, it's not the virus that's scary. And it's actually not even, <laughs> it's not the health that's scary. It's the way that the, it's just how it completely changed, the way that we react to these things is scarier. With HIV, I at least grew up that I should go get tested, go to a local clinic, wear condoms. You know, none of us know how to deal with COVID-19. None of us know how we, oh, I'm sorry, that's incorrect. We have learned how to deal with COVID-19, but somehow the messaging with dealing with it has been politicized. Um, and I guess that is reminiscent of like with HIV and AIDS. However, the difference with this is, is like, we were talking about husbands and wives wearing condoms. So they were like, I'm not going to do that. Meanwhile, people are like, I have COVID-19 and I don't want to wear a mask. And it's like, no, you know, you have exposure. You now know the, your actions could literally lead to death. And we have people politicizing it, staking it that this is like their American freedom. And it's like, no, you're clearly violating biology just to stake your claim so i think that's also been traumatic like watching watching society implode a little bit watching your fan friends and family become separate ends of something that shouldn't even politicize because it's health and then you know being a millennial and having to go through something that i thought we weren't gonna have to deal with it again i honestly was naive enough to think that aids was pretty much more, hopefully one of the big last things we had to deal with, and I thought cancer was going to be something that we were just going to deal with. These super pandemics, I just thought were, you know, the, I hate to say it, just like the quintessential boogeyman of like the scientific world. We were told that it was possible, but like, yeah, sure. And now here we are. <laughs> so I would have to, like, I'd say to your question, that, like it's complicated and completely traumatic. <laughs> That's, that's definitely fair. So then how uh, would, you know, how do you think it's impacted, um, I guess, the more physical aspect of healthcare? So I guess this is a couple part question. One, do you, uh, has it, the pandemic limited your access to healthcare and, or disrupted, um, you know, regular uh, routine healthcare, like going to the dentist or going to the doctor? Uh, and then the second part is, uh, do you know anyone who has COVID or has had a scare with COVID. And then the third part would be, have you yourself um, had a scare? So um, yeah, I guess three parts. How has it impacted your general access with healthcare and then um, whether or not you know or have ex yourself experienced it? So in regards to access to healthcare, absolutely. Um, in terms of like 
sexual health access. I'm on PrEP, so that requires every three months to get tested. That also requires every three months to see your doctor. We've had to reschedule those visits. You know, in terms of getting sick, I did get sick. Of course, during this time, you automatically think it's COVID. So when I got sick, instantly I had to go on to a telehealth. And I guess like we can, I guess now that I'm actually talking it out, I guess the access to healthcare has changed. Because of the fact that we are so worried about Corona, I mean, sorry, COVID-19, that anything relating to COVID, yes, was taken very seriously. I did get sick. I did get to see a doctor. And then I was on a COVID scare for five days, found out I had a negative testing. However, any other symptoms relating to outside of COVID, not the same. So I'm on Accutane. Those require in-person visits from, doc from dermatologists because you, you know, I look great now on camera. It doesn't mean that like I look great in person, especially for something, especially your skin. It is something that should be taken a little bit more in person. Um, but that, I mean, of course, went completely online. Completely understand, but at the same time, in order to get labs, I have to do in-person visits. So there you go. So, you know, access in that way changes. And then access to like sexual health and stuff like that, of course, the same thing. So unless you pass a certain threshold, they limit that and they don't want people to be really trying to expose themselves or trying to go out. But like, if we learn nothing from the 80s, you can't tell humanity to stop expressing a part of themselves. So how do, how do we work through that? You know, because abstinence is never the solution. So <laughs> just, I mean, now, yes, I could and have always been able in Oregon to have gotten a STI testing or something. However, I'm just saying that they try to prolong that and they try to create thresholds. And that for me, just set up a jarring experience because anyone should feel like they should be able to get better, regardless of what's happening. Uh, and in terms of prescriptions, if anything, it made everything so much more accessible. My, F, my F flexible spending account was able to accept over-the-counter medications. My medications were ready quicker. Re they had more places they were able to be picked up. It was kind of ridiculous how the healthcare system instantly flexed its muscle in that regard. So while I wasn't able to see a doctor, any type of like thing relating to access to my health care, if they didn't have to do it, was just give it. So in that sense, I don't understand. Yeah, it was, a, it was an amazing experience to be able to deal with that. Um, and in terms of your, I think one of the questions to get all three, yes, I have known someone who got COVID. Uh, my best friend from back home got COVID. She had terrible side effects but she only had them for about four to five days and then was completely fine uh so yeah okay and uh so what about i guess um kind of already answer how how has it impacted your uh you talked a little bit about your family um mostly your family back home um have they experienced any of the same things you, uh, and I guess how, yeah, for lack of a better word, how is the term, how has your family dealt with uh, this COVID crisis and um, have any of them gotten sick? Or is there any concern, just general greater concern that you have now that there's a pandemic about your family? Definitely, so my family, as I mentioned before, it does not, is not doing the same steps that I am doing. And therefore I am worried, uh, though no one's gotten sick. I am just worried about the fact that the, the lifestyle is not conducive into <laughs> being very COVID proof. Um, one thing I can definitely say is being Latino, we are a communal culture. We don't live in solitary. We never have like, and in general, my family standing is nine people, which is one away from the CDC's recommended amount of people out in the home. <laughs> so you throw in grandkids, and instantly we violate that. You throw in partners going way above that. And then if you throw in subjective partners or intentional family, you know, we disobey the federal mandate against 25 people. So it's very hard. And I, like, our family is just one of thousands exactly like that. And Arizona being a Hispanic state, mostly Hispanic state, or sorry, largely Hispanic state, you obviously see the same pattern all over. So while people were quarantining, they were quarantining with their closest fam, and closest fam is like a network 
of 50. And then if you really do a Venn diagram of how those 50 have their 50, they really were just taking like an extended vacation. And so for them, they don't see the severity because they think that their life has already been impacted because they can't get a haircut. They can't go to malls because they can't go to a restaurant. I'm like, <laughs> people in Oregon legitimately haven't seen friends, haven't seen partners. And, you know, I had a romance, I guess you could say a, an interest at the beginning of the pandemic. And that instantly had to become a friendship because of the fact that, like, you don't get to see each other and you couldn't see each other. And there was no safe way to do that because you'd see, and that's just the line of thinking we had here. That was the public message, you know, like, you got onto a train and they literally had the trains duct taped. This is my home state. Back home, you know, like people were sending videos on Instagram of their COVID party, like their COVID fiestas, you know, like they're like quarantine party, just me and my fam. And it's like them and their 10 closest friends. And you're like, this is not the point. <laughs> this was not an opportunity to come together in a community like that. It was a time to come together and like stay, the, stay home. And people just took it, I don't know what it was, like, there was just this, this separation, I feel, of ideology, but, like, we, people on my side of the fence, I don't feel like have an ideology of it, we were just told, and we listened because of that, that's what we were told, and back home, it was kind of like, this opinion, this opinion, this, like, force is being pushed upon us, and it wasn't taken as, like, instructive, or, like, a public health crisis, it was taken as, like, a political ploy, and I don't know why it was seen that way, and so I think that was the hardest thing. And that's been the most, so like that question, I can't answer like how they've taken it. I can only, I'm, I'm only able to share how I'm seeing them interpret it. Because to be quite honest, if I'm say, saying how they've taken it, they've taken it just like this is like a gift, I would almost say. They take it as almost as opportunity to like take a break from life. Whereas I personally saw this as like a catastrophic a blow to the system and I think it only led way to like the political stuff that's happening currently because so many people's lives were disrupted and so when society got further disrupted down the road everyone was able to turn their head to it finally because there was no more distractions yeah no, that's, a, that's a good point um and I, I will get back to this uh you know, the current social environment in, in a second, but I want to kind of wrap back around to um, something that you talked about earlier regarding, uh, well, kind of related to work-related impact, um, but specifically about your, uh, the economic impact. You know, you talked about both your roommates being laid off from their jobs, um, but you were able to keep your job. So was there any economic um pressure or uh, struggle that you had? Uh, were you asked to carry more of a load for the time being um, or anything of that sort to increase worries or concerns about, about money? Um, so would you just talk about, you know, kind of that financial impact for a second of either personally and on your, you know, apartment living situation in general? I think it's really hard to like, as someone who had a steady job, I think it's very hard to look at that and be like, how were you not, how is, how are you impacted negatively? If everything stayed the same with your job, the only difference is like the way that it looked, how are you impacted? And I think that people have to understand that my roommates got unemployment and the unemployment ended up being almost more than they were getting from their actual paychecks, which is like amazing. And that alleviated any communal burden. So that was great. Um, however, I think it applied pressure because now I can't lose my job amidst a instantaneous recession. That's a global recession. Um, so job security is something that is absolutely at the forefront of my mind and in a metrics based job and a performance based job that just becomes very stressful because all of a sudden something that like you could consider like a nine to five clock in clock out kind of thing um you now realize that no one else has one and you can be replaced at any time so that applies a lot of pressure the fact that a lot of luckily enough i work in a working in tech has been very securing having seen the trend that uh tech companies are actually doing very 
we're, we're the only, we're one of the only sectors of the, of the, of the economy that actually is doing really well because when the recession hit, everyone had to move online. So working for one of those platforms that offers e-commerce, I don't feel like my job's going anywhere. It doesn't seem like no one's raised any red flags. So that's amazing. Um, however, given that, that means that they have a lot of leeway. And if for some reason, you know, I underperform, it just, it provides a lot of stress. Not that they would, but layoffs are always something we have to think about. I went to college during the 2008 financial crisis. I saw very rich entrepreneurs lose everything. I now watch the global recession. Friends of mine who are making buco bucks from their Etsy shops or their private event companies, their Instagram startups, all lost everything when the pandemic hit. And not because they weren't product-based, because they were service-based entrepreneurs. So, and as someone who did event planning and was considering going into event planning and starting my own business, well, one thing that I didn't <laughs> to look what would have happened had I done that. So, and this is exactly to, to talk about it. Yeah, I think that actually speaks to culturally a lot of financial fears that we millennials have already. We already were very tepid and very scared of our money. We do not like to spend money. And I think that something that like younger people do really good at is they're able to transpire their dreams and make it a reality. Millennials came out and, and we were just told like, so the world you all thought was a reality is done and here it is. And yeah, we just kind of been licking our wound the last 10 years and then here we are kind of catching our breath. We're like, yeah, life's going well. And then a global pandemic happened, which led to a global recession. Now we are the ones who have lost most of our jobs. We're the ones who are now most of those people on unemployment. And it just applies a lot of pressure. While you might not be impacted directly, you're just impacted because you know you could be one of them at any moment. Um, and not being able to switch jobs, not being able to, not saying I want to, um, in case Squarespace ever watches this, I, would not, I don't want to leave. Um, but just the fact that your opportunities had you wanted to switch are gone. Um, and also, while one of my roommates was a hairdresser, so they were able to get their job back once the economy reopened, my other roommate, once the economy reopened, their job was gone. Their role was dissolved. So that actually now does apply pressure because the stimulus is gone. Um, the federal aid is no longer available in that way. And now people are really having to be like, what am I gonna do? Um, so yeah, now, now, now there is an eminent worry of like, how are we going to help? Um, and not to put my roommate's financial or anything on blast. It's, I'm just saying this is something that, it's not about performance space. This is now where we're at. All of a sudden people don't have jobs anymore. And all of a sudden I have, a, I, you know, I lost a lot of money when my retirement, because my retirement is a 401k. So it's based with stocks. You know, I lost $4,000. <laughs> instantly um just because of the way that that works uh so finances directly impacted you know savings accounts i've 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 had to tap into funds i didn't have before because when you're not spending money on quick accessible things and you're having to go shopping you know like i never thought that like having to cook all the time was going to be as actually financially impactful as it was, and people make it sound nice, and yes, that's well, that's true. There is a luxury to like buying nicer food, buying certain types of healthy food. If you're not trying to just eat, just to eat, that requires a certain type of diet. And so, yeah, every aspect was affected by COVID. Budgets, worry about looming financial dread, the fact that like roommates have been placed in disenfranchised spots absolutely <laughs> yeah that's interesting um about the even the financial toll the financial impact of, of cooking and how that can have impact you know um especially um eating and cooking healthy food right and what research has shown is that uh latinos in particular are specifically you know um they have less retirements uh savings uh, assets um, to their name and so we you know when they're impacted by job losses and such um, there's not a whole lot to fall back on and even in your case of when you do have something to fall back on it is being depleted 
because it's reliant on a healthy, robust economy, uh, right? So, um, well, good. So lastly, I think, uh, you know, moving from the economic and work impacts, I guess I am uh, curious about, you said earlier you identify as an, an activist and you said you have participated in um, the recent uh, protests, I'm assuming George Floyd protests. So would you mind uh, talking a bit about um, what you've done in that regard and how, uh, you know, in conjunction with, with COVID, have, has it increased your worry about catching it? Um, were you, was that a consideration when you decided to, to protest? And uh, so, yeah, kind of just describe what your involvement in that has been and any worries you have or concerns about COVID as a result. Yeah. So as a uh, employee resource co-chair, um, sometimes known as business affinity groups, uh, these groups are specifically gathered for multicultural employees to promote job to promote uh, job growth, uh, engagement, and to pretty much, as a caucus operates in a political system, this is how these employee resource groups work. And so I would say that in terms of activism, um, it's very grassroots like in terms of trying to provide employees with education and resources. So I would say that my activism is two pronged. So you have that within my role, which has a kind of like bleed out into my personal life because of those connections. I participate in going to and have, since I've moved to Portland, participated in other demonstrations, um, going to community talks, lectures, demonstrations, uh, participating donating, contributing, educating in those ways. Um, and in light of recent events, including Black Lives Matter and George Floyd, I would say that COVID was an immediate barrier for how my natural response would have been in the past. Prior to COVID, I would have considered myself the front lines person. Um, while I didn't do, while in, during college, I have experience of organizing with actual organizing. Um, I helped work for the like State Students Association for my university. Um, I did actual campaign, actual lobbying. I would say that as an adult, I moved more to a frontline participant. Um, so protesting, community calls, community organizing, those types of things and volunteer work. Um, I haven't held any type of position at a nonprofit, but going to these protests, before was like instant, you know, May Day, the Women's March. Anytime we were called to be there, I showed up. Um, in Portland, we have a constant battle amongst Proud Boys and white supremacist groups given the state's racist history. Um, and so I'm very active and always showing up in these anti-racist protests. That was before COVID. Now with COVID, I have drastically, I was not going to show up and one of the things that was called for with the Black Lives Matter restarted, I feel like, or the resurgence of Black Lives Matter after George Floyd, um, there was this call for people to post education on their social media, which was to sacrifice their own selfies, whatever, so their self-interest and make it about the cause. Um, that was very easy for me. I don't have a very, my, <laughs> my Instagram is very political to begin with. Um, my Facebook is all political reshares. Like I didn't really use these platforms as, self-promotion, they were more newsreels anyway, or ways to contribute to my uneducated family members, <laughs> uh, woke information. And so when this was called, I was like, cool, I can stay in that realm of educator and guide um, it without any safety violation to my pod um, or myself. However, I think when we saw the riots after George Floyd, that first night, I think that that instantly had a callback to the Rodney King riots, which I grew, I was a kid of the 90s. I grew up hearing about LA imploding. And it was one thing to hear about LA, and it was another thing to watch the entire country go through it. You know, it started off, I think it was, hold on. I'm just trying to remember because I don't want to get the cities wrong. But you know what? Trickle. It was a trickle effect. And by the time it had reached Portland and that night, I will never forget that the looting continued for two nights. Like by that second night, I felt it was a call to action. This was real anger we were experiencing. 
And to bring on a point that I touched on earlier, this isolation had taken away all of our distractions. There was no longer anything to be doing other than focusing on the fact that George Taylor, I mean, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor had just been murdered. And it wasn't just them. Like, this is what the thing that had been going on for so many months beforehand. This was just two very prominent names that had come out of a series of black murders. And so this, I think, was the tipping point for everyone who was just watching to get involved. And for myself as a brown person and as a Latino, you know, it's extremely interconnected. I have two black, I have a black nephew and a black biracial niece in like, well, I might not be black myself. I am interconnected in that. And I am in Queer Man, which is a complete movement that is founded on the intersectionality of the black participation, and the black panther and the Mattachines and act up like our histories are so interconnected and so intertwined that like, yes, my skin color is not black and my narrative is not black, but I'm not like a white ally. I am actually very interconnected and a part of the story. And so I had to speak out and I had to put my body on the line. And I feel like that threshold was crossed. And as an ally, no longer was I called to be a guide. I had to show up because they've shown up for me in the past. Angela Davis has shown up for my community. You know, Marsha P. Johnson is accredited with sparking the Stonewall riots. And regardless if that is completely factual or not, she's attributed with that. So, like, I had to. <laughs> like, screw the pandemic. I had to show up. But, you know, that did come with great consideration. I had to tell my quarantine family we had to consider ending our quarantine relationship in that way. You know, I had to ask permission from my roommates because their health was impacted. And had either of those kind of gone wrong, I really might have deterred me from going. And I had known people because of their roommates or because of their living situation, they didn't go. Um, but I don't fault them for it. I think that it was definitely a privileged factor because if you felt like the call for racial equality and like social justice just was worth getting sick over, then I guess that's like where I lied because I just didn't care anymore. And to be quite honest, as a brown person that operates in America, the likelihood of that same healthcare system caring if I got COVID or not, it already just fortunately wasn't gonna work in my favor. So like I get COVID or I don't get COVID. It's kind of like, I'm damned if I do, damned if I don't. Um, disproportionately, I'm already statistically higher to get it. So like, well, let's bring it on. <laughs> like, this was so much more um, important. So I feel like a calling greater than self just came into play. And uh, complete disregard for catching it for some reason just was more fervent than like worrying about anything else. Yeah, of course. And so would you say, um, you know, that you're, I guess your identity as a Latino queer man uh, impacted your um, want to risk uh, even catching COVID for the sake of, uh, you know, solidarity, um, especially in a time like now and with, you know, um, politically, we don't have to talk about the, the entire political situation, but with an administration that has, you know, demonized um, or at least fostered a climate of uh, demonization towards uh, black and brown people, um, especially Latinos. Um, so would you say that's basically kind of, not to ask a leading question, but uh, is that where the motivation comes from? I think that you don't, it's not a leading question because you just have to look at the series of political events that have transpired for the last like four years. Like we have literally seen a president support racist ideologies and specifically targeted against black and brown communities and if you want to like if we divert specifically to this community that can speak towards in the latino community he entered this wanting to build a wall between my nation of origin but you know if you want to break that down i am so deep arizonan that you can't really trace back my heritage that doesn't interconnect Mexico and Arizona like that and I'm trying to highlight the fact that like trying to build a wall between Mexico and the southern United States was a I think a declaration about what he was trying to build a wall between which is the United States and the Latino community and after that trying to end DACA trying to vehemently come after people and to deport them um, the concentration camps that are enacted across the United States like 
he has purposely attacked brown people. He has purposely come after the Latino community. He is purposely trying to, I don't know, it's not even assimilate. So he's trying to cut off our ties to our culture. And I think that in order to highlight why George Floyd is so important, you have to look at it in a grand scheme of things. So it's not just one shade, it's all of them. And he's coming after all of us. He's coming after all that is not Trump and all that is not white and all that is not this old grandstanding America. And I think that the Hispanic community represents a very scary thing for people in the United States because we are going to be soon the largest minority group in the United States. And we will probably be a majority in the next 40 to 50 years. And like, that's just because we are one of the fastest growing ethnic groups in the world. Spanish is, I think, one of the top three languages spoken in the world. You know, it, it is, it's just a fact. And that change really scares people because uh, once was the colonized, now becomes this huge impact. And now we're the majority. And that is very scary. I have a friend who is a professor um, at Northern Arizona University, and she describes this time as like the white man's dying breath. And I don't mean like white man as like a race to demonize, but I mean the sub, the, what that stands for, the archetype of the colonizing white cis male is dying in America because that culture is just meant to be idealized and put on this pedestal and we're taking it apart. We're taking apart policing, we're taking apart the in inequities in healthcare, we're taking apart the reliance upon corporations, which only really benefit white people, regardless of the few C like CEOs of color that we might have. Like, we're in a time right now, I think, where these race things are not just like here to prove that some people are put down, but to show this hole and this these holes in this giant working machine. And I think that those of us called to activism are feeling like it's our job to repair, not just repair these holes, but maybe like, okay, we need a whole machine. <laughs> like a whole new machine that's broken. And I think that like I won't I won't generalize any groups specifically. So I'll just say that people who align with this populist, fascist. Trump like regime want that machine to stay the same. And they think the holes are caused by those of us who just want a whole new machine. And so they will deal with the holes because they literally just want us out. Right? They want to get us out of their machine. They want us in a completely different thing because they don't even, deep down, they don't consider us American. They don't consider homosexuals American. They don't consider Latinos American. They don't consider Blacks American. We are just all accessories to their American ideal and their American community. And that I think has been highlighted by the response and the politicalization of what's going on with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and then what's also happening with COVID. I think they, you can't separate the two because they both are directly related. Uh, absolutely, that's a really good point. Um, especially, you know, the, the response uh, to COVID, especially as, we, as we've seen it's disproportionately impacted communities of color, um, primarily black and Latino communities. Uh, the response, you know, it's hard to remove the response from being uh, political in that in that realm. Um, okay, well, so we have, I just have one last question, and we can wrap up. And it's not much of a question, uh, or it is a question, but uh, I guess, is there anything else you would like to share about your experience with COVID that I did not ask, um, or to, that we did not talk about? I think that, like, one thing that I just have to, like, I think advocate for is that we didn't learn from our past as a society. And I think Fauci brings it up and it was quite interesting to learn that Dr. Fauci is the same Dr. Fauci that worked with Larry Kramer, well worked with and against Larry Kramer during the AIDS crisis. And the fact is we need to learn and build upon the mistakes of the past. And I think as a Latino specifically, I think that we don't, view ourselves technically intrinsic we don't find ourselves within the american history and so i think the aids crisis completely swept over our community without it really playing we don't feel like we were touched by it and because of that lack of education 
I don't think that we learned or have really paid attention to how this is going to impact us. And so I think that, like, as a forewarning, I really wish that as a Hispanic, I could have done more to communicate this to my community, how this is probably going to affect us really bad. And I think we're seeing that now with Arizona and Texas and Florida, three mostly Latino states with some of the worst resurgences of the, the second wave that we're calling it, right, with COVID. And I think that had they had more historical context and more knowledge of the past, that maybe themselves might have taken this more seriously or would be taking it more seriously. Absolutely. You could make a good point, you know, about the, the three states that are being most adversely affected. And even, you know, it's not even technically the second stage or second wave. It's still the, the first wave. Um, but uh, Which is even scarier. <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. Well, if there's any, nothing else, then we can uh, uh, wrap up. Anything else you have to add? Uh, no. Thank you so much. All right. I'm going to go ahead and end this.